My hair look okay? Yeah. Hey guys, welcome back. Hello. All right, we ready to go at, go at it one more time? <laughs> yeah, because we are at, uh, this is week number seven, I believe. Yeah, week number seven, so. We're getting there little by little. Anyway, I what I want to do. Question. Sorry, sure, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to interrupt no. you. Um, so go right ahead, no problem. Activity four, uh, chapter six still says it's being graded uh, for me. Uh, I lost, I lost your, okay, activity four, chapter, chapter six, okay. Yeah, activity four, chapter six says it's still being graded. Um, any idea when that might be finished? Oh, I, I lost you again. I don't know if it's me, but I, I'm, I'm getting every other word. Um, it's not graded yet. I didn't know when it might be finished. Oh, no, no. I haven't graded those yet. Okay. Done, All right. Yeah. Yeah. Not cool. done Thank yet. you. Yeah. They should, I should have those all, everything caught up by this week. I just finished a bunch of the, the exams from my three sections, so. All right. I didn't mean to come uh, off rude. I was just asking. Um, yeah, I didn't know. Problem. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. You guys have a question. Don't hesitate to ask. Uh, is this, this is your class. You paid good money. <laughs> All right. Well, somebody paid good money. Anyway, um, let me share uh, our schedule as far as the calendar from uh, Zoom, hold on, I can't say. Okay, and so this is, uh, for both my sections, had the same, you guys had the same schedule. So today's a six, uh, homework seven uh, was yesterday. We don't have anything planned exam-wise until the 20th, which will be chapter seven through nine. Uh, so we're we're ahead with respect to chap uh, chapters, which is a good thing. We're ahead, so let's continue with that and uh, get you ready for the next next exam. All right, so where did we leave off? Here we go. We ended off here on chapter eight, eight point three, slide number twelve. We were uh, talking. This particular chapter talks about. Uh, deals with nomenclature or naming of compounds, okay? And we went over these examples specifically, we were talking about these polyatomic ions. Now to refresh your memory, I'll pull this up one more time, is on the periodic table on the bottom left corner, there is a table of the most common polyatomic ions that we utilize. Notice that most, a lot of them are, uh, uh, covalent bonded, but uh, the nature of the beast, if you will, is that they end up with a negative charge uh, based on the structure that they have and so forth. And so you'll find the majority of them to be the polyatomic ions to be anions or negative charge. Uh, we got one there, which is uh, ammonium, as a positive, the only cation example that you have. Now, the point about these polyatomic ions is one, actually two points. One, point number one is they each have their own specific name, which does not change, okay? And um, two is that we don't separate the units, like NO3, the very first one in the top right column, that is called the nitrate. And if we need to add more, we need to show, demonstrate more of the nitrates, uh, we use a parenthesis followed by a subscript, and that subscript designates how many more we need when we need more than one. So we can need two, three, or four, whatever number, but we use a parenthesis to isolate the polyatomic ion. Okay? So, <clears throat> excuse me. The other aspect to refresh your memory is when we start putting them together to make compounds, we want to put enough of the cations 
and enough of the anions together such that they cancel each other out with respect to the charge. And so magnesium number one, it, in, in ionic form, that is a plus two charge uh, species. And so we know that because magnesium is in group two. And second, it's a metal. And so when it becomes ionic, it will have a plus two charge, okay? The hydroxides are telling you there, it's a polyatomic ion with a negative charge. And so now I gotta put enough of each together such as, such as that they cancel out to equal zero. So this means that I need two, and that's what to, that coefficient in front of the hydroxy ion is. I need two of those, which that two eventually becomes a subscript for the formula itself, okay? Then we talked about potassium and then the PO4 negative three. <coughs> that is the phosphate. And we know that the ionic form of potassium is a plus one because it's in group one. So it's important when we're putting compounds together, specifically with the metals that you understand or know what the charge is, what is the oxidation number of the cation of the metal part. Now, I also demonstrated from the periodic table from the periodic table that there are 16 elements in ionic form that you know 100% of the time their oxidation number their charge okay and now it's be group 1 and group 2 which encompasses 12 of them they always have a constant charge group 1 has a plus 1 group 2 has a plus 2 and then I added four of them, the aluminum, zinc, silver, and cadmium. Those four with the other 12 gives you a total of 16. Those 16 always have a constant oxidation number. Now, why, why is that important? That means that all the other metals, all, all the other 100 plus metals that are left, when we talk about their oxidation number, we have to designate it by using Roman numerals. Okay, because they can contain more than one oxidation number. And we designate that by using Roman numerals, hence number five, that Roman numeral belongs to copper. And that tells you that, that copper that you're using is copper plus two. Okay, so you, you need, to, uh, rec need to recognize that, the Roman numerals. <laughs> other than that, when the other metals are part of 16, you just have to remember actually those four that are extra ones, the uh, group one and group two, you should hopefully by now know that you're gonna be a plus one or a plus two. And that's for everybody in that group. So using Roman numerals uh, with a plus two, we have the carbonate, which is the polyatomic ion. Again, from the periodic table of the polyatomic ions has a negative two, so we can simply put those together on a one-to-one -one basis. Now, if when we start getting into naming these compounds, this would be the name. Be copper, obviously, because we know copper is the name for Cu, for the symbol Cu. And we use Roman numeral and then carbonate. Okay. And that would be its name. Now notice the CO3, the name of the unit is carbonate. You might be tempted to say carbon trioxide or something like that. That's, that's not correct. That whole unit is carbonate, as in number four, the whole unit NO3 is nitrate. In number three, the SO4 is sulfate. In number two, the PO4 is the phosphate. And the last one, the number one, OH is the hydroxide. Okay. All right. So, Now, I mean, this is basically what I just stated about the constant or the fixed uh, oxidation state or charge versus the one that's variable. We're going to use Roman numerals for the one for the ones that are variable. Now, four. We got a question. Okay, no problem, Nick. Okay, I will. I got this recording, so you can check that out later on. All right. So um, 
with respect to naming, we've already introduced the naming aspect of it. The thing to take away or remember is that the anion is who we change the name. The metal part remains the same. Sodium is sodium regardless if it's an element or an ionic form. We just distinguish either saying sodium element or sodium ion. The anion is the one that changes its name. So in this case, chlorine, which is the element, once it becomes the ion, becomes chloride. Okay. And that is true for all the nonmetals that we will be utilizing. Now the name that we change it to is it continues even when we start naming molecular covalent compounds. So like carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is a covalent bond, but the oxygen in that state is still being called oxide. Okay? So looking at the periodic table with respect to name changing, when we look at through nitrogen and fluorine going across the board, that nitrogen becomes nitride, oxygen oxide, fluorine becomes fluoride. When we look at phosphorus through sulfur and chloride, it becomes phosphide, sulfide, and chloride. And we can say the truth for SC selenium becomes selenide and Br for brom bromide. And normally we're not going to use T, but iodide you'll see around, you'll see quite often. So Iodine becomes iodine. Okay, so those names change for the anion, whether they they are are ionic compounds or covalent compounds. Let's go back. So that sort of chloride. Now, KBr. Okay, you might be tempted to say bromine, but remember. Uh, normally, 99% of the time, the formula for inorganic compounds, the very first uh, element that you see written will be the metal. So you see it written as potassium, and then that tells you the fact that this must be an ionic compound because what should come right after that will be a non-metal, in this case, bromide. Okay? So it's name is potassium bromide magnesium, and then we have oxygen, which is now in the oxide form. So this is magnesium oxide. Now here you might be tempted to say, okay, I got F2, the diatomic fluorine, but the fact is that you got a metal in front of the F2, that's a flag to tell you, I got a, an ionic compound. So it's not fluorine, but this is fluoride, calcium, fluoride okay and we have lithium sulfide okay and silver chloride now let me let me mention something about the sulfur part real quick okay and so we got s which is the element sulfur now, once it becomes the anion with a negative two because it's in group six, okay, it becomes name-wise sulfide, okay? Now, when you see sulfur, and right immediately after sulfur, you have an oxygen bonded to it, and specifically, you may have either, either four or three. This one, let's make this one uh, three. This is a polyatomic ion with a negative two charge, and this is sulfite, okay? Now we got again sulfur immediately followed by oxygen, in this case, this time four. It also has a negative two, but its name is sulfate. They all have the pre prefix for sulfur, S-U-L or sulf, okay? Where they differ, obviously, is the is the, uh, the the lettering at the end. So sulfur would tell you if you read that is the element. The IDE would tell you I have the single sulfur ion. The ITE would tell you I have the uh, sulfur bonded to oxygen, specifically three of them. 
and then the ATE, similar things bonded to oxygen, but there's four of them, okay? All right, so we have this one here, silver and chloride, okay? And notice here that there are no prefixes. Calcium fluoride, for example, is simply calcium fluoride. We don't call it calcium difluoride, okay? Or number four, you see two lithiums, we don't say dilithium sulfide, just simply lithium sulfide. So here's something to put in long-term memory. When it comes to ionic compounds, okay, ionic compounds only, no prefixes, no di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, anything of those. When we get to molecular compounds, then we bring in prefixes, okay? All right, so there's a difference there. So it will be incorrect for number three to be named calcium trifluoride, and it will be counted in wrong appropriately, okay? <clears throat> All right, so um, you got that first example on, on top, NO3, you know, we might be tempted. First of all, you got a sodium written first, it's the nonmetal which flags to you, I have an ionic compound. And then you got nitrogen, you might think nitride. However, immediately following that nitrogen, you have oxygen. So that takes away from the nitride. Now you're gonna determine and remember, do I have the, the nitrite or the nitrate? So refer to the polyatomic table. Eventually with time, you recognize that NO3 is called nitrate, okay? So it's, this name would be simply sodium nitrate. You might be tempted to call this nitrogen trioxide. That would be totally incorrect. And that nitrate group has its own specific name. All right. So similar, similar aspect here. You know, what we do, what I do is first, when I first started this is, you know, with any potential problem you got to work at, break it down into small pieces, okay? When you break it down into small pieces, it, it, it kind of helps you understand things as you go along. And if you repeat these, systematic approach of breaking them down, you eventually get to the point where you can just glance and look at it and you know it, okay? And so, for example, let's take this one here. And first thing we notice is we got potassium up front, okay? So that indicates I, got a, I have an ionic compound. The fact that I got potassium, it's a metal, I got an ionic compound. Then the next one is you see phosphorus. You might think phosphide, however, we have an oxygen immediately after that phosphorus. Plus we have four of them. So that thing should tell you, I have a polyatomic ion. Go to the table, you will see it to, to be called the phosphate, which has a negative three charge. So therefore, I need two positives, three positives from potassium to counter the negative three. So its name would be simply potassium phosphate. Okay, how about this one? Somebody want to take a shot at this one? What would be its name? That'd be calcium hydroxide. You got it. Okay, so you see calcium first, inorganic compound, then I see a parenthesis. Boom, parenthesis is a flag for you, it says, Send me to the polyatomic ion table because what's coming up is a polyatomic ion. Look up the OH, you'll see it to be a negative one and it's called hydroxide, okay? So this would be simply calcium hydroxide, all right? How about this one here? Anyone wanna take a shot at that one? So zinc sulfide. Mm, so did you say sulfide? I D E. Zinc sulfate. Sulfate. You got it. Sulfate. Okay. Again, systematic approach. You know, Z and zinc. You see sulfur. You might think I D E sulfide, but then you see immediately after that the oxygen. So that sends you to the polyatomic ion table, and specifically since there's four of them, that will be the sulfate. That will be the sulfate. Okay, all right, so now 
with respect to um, the metals that do not have a constant or a known uh, oxidation number, we have to figure it out, okay? To determine which metal we're working with so we know what um, name to, to give it. Now, recall that I gave you a general formula a while back that said the number of cations plus the number of anions will equal zero, okay? Equal zero. And so I have to put enough cations together with enough anions together to cancel the, the respective charge, okay? And you will always know the charge of one, if not more, of the uh, ions. And here we don't know what the copper is because copper can have is a multivariate or a variable oxidation number. But what do we know? We know the charge of the chloride. Okay, the chloride is in group seven. It would always have a, a negative one. And so with that being the case, I know the chloride, I can set up a very simple algebraic expression where the zinc, which I don't know the charge, plus I know there's two chlorides and each one's a negative one. So I got a total of negative two and that is equal to zero, okay? That be, oh, when I say zinc, sorry. Copper, okay? And so that tells me that what, what, what charge must copper be? Anybody have an idea? Uh, two, just positive. It has two. to be, exactly, it has to be, you have to be specific with the positive or negative, but yes, it has to be a positive two because we have two negatives. And so therefore, the, the copper that we're working with here is copper Roman numeral two chloride, okay? Which would be different than another form of copper chloride, which would be copper one chloride. Two distinct different uh, chemicals. One is a greenish color and the other one is a blue, real pretty blue color. In fact, growing up in Superior many hundred years ago, we used to play in water, which had a very beautiful blue color. We thought we were playing in the ocean. Yeah, on the ocean in, in the middle of uh, the desert. Well, later, many years later, as I became a chemist, I realized, I figured out that that copper, that blue color was coming from all the residue copper. Superior is a, is a copper mining town. And uh, not only that, but there's a, also used cyanides to extract copper. So we were playing in all kinds of heavy metals up there. Anyway, here's another one, okay? Again, similar scenario. Look at the metal, it's lead. It's not part of the 16. So therefore we don't know what its oxidation state is, but what is the oxidation state of the oxide? Anybody know what that, what oxide, what its oxidation state is? What group is oxygen in? Uh, six. Group six. So once it, once it becomes an ion, what is its charge? Negative, Negative two. two. What is the what is the charge of the oxide ion? Ne Negative three. Whoa, Negative three. It's in group. It's in group uh, six. Oh no, no. Negative, negative, two. negative two. Negative two. Okay. Negative two. Exactly. And plus, we got two of them, correct? And so our total negative is a negative four. Okay. So therefore, what must lead be here? Two. 
So it must Four. Sulfate. But then? It must be four. Oh, PB. It has to be four, right? It has to be a plus four. Because plus four plus a negative four equals zero. So lead in this scenario, and this compound is a lead four. And so its name would be lead Roman numeral IV, which represents four oxide. Okay, here, here we have another one here. Again, nickel, we don't know what the charge is. Okay. Uh, we don't know what nickel's charge is, so we can set up a little general equation here. Or nickel plus, we know that the bromides each have a negative one, and there's three of them. Okay, oh, three of them. So that would be equal to zero. So nickel, the charge of nickel plus the negative three coming from the bromide implies that nickel must be a plus three, correct? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And so therefore to write its name would be nickel Roman numeral three bromide. Now in these in these examples, you always you right now you always you know the charge of the anion, but it's very easy to have the other direction where you know the charge of the cation. For example, all right, what if I were to suggest for you and say, okay, um, sodium, this is a subscript, X, sodium three, subscript three X, okay, what must be the charge of X? What would you say? Three. Negative three. Negative three, exactly. Because in this case, you don't know what X is. It's charge. It could be anything. Okay. But you know the, the oxidation number of sodium because it's always a plus one. And you got three of them. So overall, I got a plus three. That infers that X must be a negative three. Okay, good. All right, manganese. Then we got the sulfate, which has a negative two charge. It's a polyatomic ion. So this must be manganese two. Exactly, manganese two. Now here we got copper again. We did copper two chloride in the very first example. Here, the nitrates, the NO3, is a polyatomic ion. It has a negative one charge. So that infers that copper must be a plus one, okay? Hence, now its name would be copper, parentheses, I, in parentheses, nitrate. If that, NO, if that was NO2, that would be nitrite. Okay, now here we got this one here. Okay, so we have CO, which is cobalt. And then you got nitrogen. Now, there's nothing following nitrogen. So right there, that tells you we're dealing with nitride, okay? Because it's just nitrogen all by itself. And so now we, ionic nitride is a negative three because nitrogen is in group five and picks up three electrons. And so that implies that cobalt must be a plus three. Okay. Therefore, its name would be cobalt, Roman numeral three, nitrite, okay? All right, so in these examples here, uh, we knew the charge of the anion, but in that example I gave you with the sodium X, it can go the other way around too. You always will know the oxidation state or the oxidation number of one of the ions. Okay. Now this one here is a little more challenging but doable, okay. Now, I would, I would, I would break it down, keep it simple, okay. Now, I got to get the name. So, what is the name for Fe? That would be iron, okay. And iron is not part of the 13, uh, sixteen. So I know I get a 
I gotta have to give it a Roman numeral. Which one it is, I don't know at this time. Okay. Now, I see that CO3 is in parentheses. That means that's a polyatomic ion. So I go to the polyatomic ion table and that tells me that I have carbonate. So oh. I have, I have the carbonate ion. Now the question is, what fits in that parentheses? Because I got the, I got the base name there. I got iron carbonate, but I have to give it a Roman numeral because I know that iron is not part of the sixteen. So which one would, would it be? I have, I have a choice of iron one all the way to infinity. Would it be three? Three, yeah. How'd you come up with three? Uh, so because there are two irons and there are three, uh, what is it? Carbonates, they both okay. hold add up to the same charge, the carbonate is negative two. So negative two times three is negative six. Therefore, Fe2 must be six. If you cut that in half, you get three. Okay. That, that looks reasonable. So we can do this too, watch. We can, we can still set up a, uh, a algebraic equation, right? We can say there's two irons, correct? Because that's what the formula tells us. Okay, so that takes care of the cation part. And we know that the carbonates are uh, negative two, because again, you can look that up in the polyatomic ion. And since each one's negative two and there's six of them, we have a total of negative six. Okay. And so here we have the general algebraic equation where you got two, VFE plus a negative six equals zero. I move the six over to the right side of the equation. It gives me two F equals positive six. I get rid of, I divide through by two. That means that each iron is a plus three. So, which by the way, if you think about it, and so that becomes iron three carbonate. And if you think about it, just by looking at the subscript of the anion, that is the charge of the cation, right? And if you look at the subscript of the cation, which is two, well, that is the charge of the anion. Does that make sense? So it kind of crosses out for you a quick way to to find the uh, oxidation states of the uh, ions or the polyatomic ions that you're working with. So iron three carbonate. Okay. So here they're asking you to, given the formula, give the name. Okay. And so SR is strontium. And if we got to find in the periodic table, it is number 38, okay? Number 38 is in group two and it's a metal. Therefore, it would have a plus two charge. So when you're given these problems, break it down into the ions first before, so you can figure out how many of each you need, okay? And then the hydroxides is given as a negative one. So that means that I need two hydroxides for every strontium, which means I got to use the parentheses to demonstrate how many hydroxides I have. Okay, I'll show you the results here in the mo in the moment. Right now, we're just going to break it down. All right. So the next one here is AU. Anybody know what AU is? A lot of it. Gold, exactly. So here they're asking you to get the name. So we got gold, and it's not part of the 16. So we don't know what Roman numerals 
we need. And we know it's, it, it is bonded to chloride. And so now that's, a, that's the, the, base, the base name, if you will. All we need to do is determine uh, what the question marks are. And we go that, back to the formula because wait. we know that. Or are we on the, okay, never mind. I, I thought we were still on the first one. That's why I got confused. Oh, for no, a no, no, it's okay. We are, we're on the second one. So the chlorides each are, have a negative one and there's three of them. What does that infer? That gold must be. Three. That's unreasonable. Three, you're correct. Okay. All right, now if you look at the number three, we got zinc and we got oxide. Well, they want you to figure, to write a formula. Well, before I can do that, I need to first put them in ionic form so I can make sure that I got them together in the correct number. So we know that zinc is part of the 16 for one, plus it has a plus two charge. Is those four extra ones I gave you besides group one and group two. And then we know that oxygen is oxide when it becomes ionic. Okay, so in this scenario, it's a straightforward one-to-one, -one, one zinc and one ox oxide, okay? All right, now, the next one's a little more challenging, but doable, break it down. They give you barium, BA. But we need to find the ion of barium. What is the charge oxidation number of barium ion? It's a metal, so it be plus two, exactly. And then the phosphate, PO4, is a negative three. Oh, yes. negative three. Okay. And so now I got a positive two and a negative three. I got to put them together in such a number that they balance each other off with respect to the charge. So I need to find a common number and this common number is six, six. right? Yeah. Exactly. So I need, I need three bariums and two phosphates. And those numbers become the substrates. All right. All right, number five, we got lithium, which is a plus one charge. And then SO3, which you might think is sulfate, but remember there's sulfate and sulfite. And this is one less oxygen than sulfate. This is sulfite. Okay. So lithium is a plus one. I need two of them because the sulfites are a negative two. two. Okay, so we need two of those. And then we got aluminum, number six. Who knows the charge for aluminum? Plus three. You got it, plus three. And then what about the charge for sulfide? Negative two. You got it. That is correct. So very similar to number, uh, what was it, number four. We have to find a common factor, again, which is six. And so uh, we're going to need two aluminums and three sulfides. Okay, everybody see that? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so far so good. Now the next one says, uh, what is the name? Well, break it down. We got copper. Right, and we don't know what the Roman number is because copper is not part of the 16. And I apologize for being redundant, but I'm just overemphasizing the approach of attacking these problems over and over again. So eventually you get to the point where you just look at it and you, you just, you, you know the answer, okay? It's like riding a bike. I don't know how many of you got on a bike the very first time in your life and took off 50 miles an hour. Many people did sir, that. Sir, I did that with my eyes closed. I don't know what you're talking about. I am a living legend. <laughs> okay. Well, not me, because I fell down a few times. So, uh, fortunately, Jordan uh, was able to jump on it and take off. But some of us had to go stepwise. So, uh, 
Anyway, it took me a few steps before I can get that thing to work. You may have heard of my father, Thomas J. Brady. Thomas J. Brady, I'm, I'm not familiar. Tom Brady. Oh, okay. Tis, tis my father. I'm just kidding. It's not my father. Anyways, uh, have fun. <laughs> Keep teaching. Okay. All right. I don't know anybody outside can see. I'm talking cheese here. Sorry, side note. Don't want to get carried away here. So we got the NO3, which we look and look, look up in the periodic table. Again, that is a nitrate ion. And so we're almost there with that's the parrot name. Now we just got to figure out what the question marks are. What is the charge on the clock? Who do you think it what do you think it is, guys? For copper nitrate. What number should I put in the parentheses? Well, what Roman numeral number? I'm gonna throw out a, <laughs> throw out a guess here. Would it be? Um... All right, you broke up. Roman numeral six. Six. Yeah. Okay, so this one. You said to give it a guess, so I'm guessing. Bro, no, no, don't, don't guess, don't guess. It, what, what, would it be two? Okay, let's figure out. So six wouldn't work, right? But let's let's think through two. Okay, what are the nitrates? The NO threes. What does each one have, charge wise? Negative one. Negative one. Negative one. Okay, and how many do you have? Two. How many? How, what's that number outside the parentheses? Two. Two. So you have two negative ones. That means copper has to be positive two, okay? So don't don't let don't let the the number the subscripts in the parentheses confuse you. That is the unit of the nitrate ion. What's important is the the subscript outside the parentheses. Okay, that tells you how many of those polyatomic ions you have. So you got a full negative two. You got uh, two negative ones for a total negative two, which means copper must be a plus two. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. So that being the case, that is the answer is there. Okay, for you. All right. So you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of not a lot, but you're gonna see questions like, give me the formula uh, or the name. So, you know, be able to go in both directions here with the formula to give it a name or vice versa, okay? Vice versa. So you might be given the name, write the formula. All right? All right, so we can do we can do this one here. We got sodium nitrite. Notice nitrite, polyatomic ion. Those are the NO2. Okay, and we know sodium is a plus one. The nitrates are negative one. Okay, nickel Roman Roman numeral three oxide. And so, given the name, the first thing to do is to, I would quickly write the ions, put them on ionic form. So we got nickel plus two, excuse me, plus three, and then obviously the oxide and negative two. Once I know that, I can, oh, that's, that's supposed to be a negative two, not an underscore. Once I know that, and then I can bring them together to write the formula. You got magnesium iodide, which is a plus two for magnesium, and the iodides are each a negative one. Okay, we need two of them. The cyanide, again, polyatomic ion, <coughs> has a negative one for a CN species. Aluminum, as you know, has a negative three. So therefore, we need three cyanides for each aluminum. All right. 
So sodium nitrate, nitrite, nickel three oxide, and magnesium iodide, and aluminum cyanide. Those are the three formulas for those species. Now at this time, you notice that you can mix and match here. You know, you, you have access to a number of compounds. I can, I can mix the sodium with the oxide or the iodide or the cyanide, okay? I can mix the nickel with the nitride yeah? or the iodide or the cyanide or any of the other polyatomic ions or any of the other uh, um, nonmetal anions that we've been working with. And so you're probably up to about four or 500 compounds that you can put together. Okay. Quite a bit, actually. All right, which brings us to covalent compounds. Now, as I mentioned before, the ionic compounds, we don't use prefixes. It is only here with covalent compounds that we use prefixes, okay? Now, we don't talk about the ions and the other aspect about I the difference between ionic compounds and covalent compounds. All of the ionic compounds, which are made up of a metal and nonmetal, when we put those compounds in water, a lot of them dissociate 100%. Some may di dissociate only you know, 5%, but nevertheless, they literally all dis dissociate to a certain extent, meaning that the, the ions break apart completely into the positive part and the negative part of the ions. Covalent compounds do not do that. Covalent compounds literally have a bond they don't dissociate when you put them in water. They stay intact, okay? The only exception of a covalent compound that dissociates are what are called acids. And we're gonna talk about those acids in the next chapter. Things like hydrochloric acid, HCl is a covalent compound, but because it is an acid, it will dissociate. Other than that, all covalent compounds do not dissociate when we put them in solution. Now, that being said, with respect to not making ions, they still have an oxidation number. That's why we use the term oxidation number because it applies for ionic compounds that dissociate into a full-fledged charge. And it also applies to compounds that are covalent that they have a partial charge. So oxidation number encompasses uh, both ionic and covalent compounds. Okay, now we use the prefixes, mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, and octa. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Those are the prefixes uh, for uh, quantity. Sometimes you do see these other ones, which is non, Nana, which is uh, nine, and Deca, which is 10, okay? All right, now. Hear it? Now, naming this, okay. We have, uh, the first element in a compound. Now, depending what it is, to make a difference if it's on, uh, which one it is, the very first one, we keep its name as whatever it is, okay? You'll find an example here, like, like iodine tri uh, hexafluoride or heptafluoride. Iodine is the first, your, the first atom that you see written is the central atom. Then you have a multiple of things bonded to it when we, when we talk about covalent compounds. Okay. Yeah, Brian brings up the point, dihydrogen monoxide. That's a, that is the official name, for, well, the technical name for water. In fact, if you look that up in the internet, do a search for dihydrogen monoxide. 
you find all kinds of crazy stuff about how dangerous it is. Yeah, it could be dangerous, but it's not that bad. Anyway, <clears throat> the, the non-metal name and the prefix in the first part of the name, followed by the prefixes if it's there, and then the second non-metal name, which we continue with the ID extension as pref uh, suffix. So oxygen still remains oxide. If nitrogen is the second non-metal, it still remains as nitride, so on and so forth, fluoride and so forth. So the non-metal that we change the name to the ID extent, extent, uh, suffix is true for either covalent and ionic compounds with respect to naming. Okay. When <laughs> we don't use the mono for the first non-metal. So for example, H2O technically should be called dihydrogen monoxide because the, the, uh, uh, there's two hydrogens, but if, if it was one hydrogen, it would just simply call hydrogen monoxide. All right, let's do a, a few examples. We have carbon and oxygen. So this is very familiar, carbon dioxide, okay? Carbon, um, normally when we write, when you see the formula, the first non-metal that you see is normally the central atom. And then what follows is everything else bonded to the central atom. So this is carbon dioxide because there's two oxygens, okay? Compared to this one, which would be called carbon monoxide. Notice the prefix mono monoxide. And to show that the demonstration show there's only one oxygen. Okay. Who wants to take a shot at this one? Well, let, before we do that, let me show you. I, as I mentioned, I always take a start off with a systematic approach and my problem. So I got here uh, P2O5. All right. So first thing I want to do is write the base name. So I got phosphorus, that's the first element that I see, okay, phosphorus. And then the second element, which is bonded to the first element, is the oxygen. When it's bonded, so because it's the second element, we don't change the name, it's still oxide. So right now, phosphorus oxide is the parent name for number two. Since it's covalent, because I got two non-metals, now I come in and put in my prefixes. And so there's two Die. phosphorus, right? So I got di. And how many oxygens Entra. do we have? Di. Who knows the prefix? Pentra. For Penta. Pen yeah. So the prefix is penta. Now, English says that if the next letter is a vowel, then we got to drop the A. So the next letter is a vowel, A E I O U, and so be pentoxide. Okay. If you forget to drop the A, I, it's acceptable for me, not a problem. So we have diphosphorus pentoxide. Okay. That corresponds to the slides. All right, how about this one? Who wants to take a shot at this one? What would I call that? Phosphorus trifluoride. You got it. Wait, phosphorus, yeah, trifluoride. Yep. So the base name, if I go through the approach I did, is I got phosphorus and I got fluoride. So the base name is phosphorus fluoride, like I did with the oxide. And then I go back and add the prefixes. There's only one phosphorus, so we don't use mono, but it's the first one by itself, okay? So it just becomes phosphorus trichloride, I'm gonna say chloride, but it could be chloride too. Okay, now, how about this one? Um, iodine hep hept fluoride. Heptafluoride. Heptafluoride. Right? Yeah, hepta. 
You got it. Now, let's break it down. Okay, I then is the first element that you see. Okay, that means that its name remains the name that it has as an element, iodine. So that means that everything following that is bonded to the iodine. Then we see that what comes up is chloride. Okay, the fluorides are bonded to the iodine. So hence the suffix fluoride. After that, right there, iodine fluoride will be the parent base name. And now we go back and we add the prefix and the prefix for seven is hepta, okay? Oh, where's penta? Hepta fluoride, okay? Here we don't drop the A because F is not a, not a vowel. Okay, at the fluoride. And it's clear. All right. This this is a this is a crazy looking compound, but don't let the craziness of, of it looking that to slow you down. Same process, break it down. Get to the base name first, okay? We got BR first, written first. So that is the, the, the central atom. In fact, there's three of them. Those oxides are bonded to the central bromine. So we call it bromine. Now bromide, if it, bromide followed the central atom, then it would become bromide. Here is bromine. And then we got oxygen bonded to the bromine. So Again, we use oxide like we did with inorganic, the uh, inorganic compound or the ionic compounds, okay? Now we got the, the base name, bromine oxide. Now we ne need to add the prefixes, okay? And we got three bromine, so it's tri. And then we got eight. And the prefix for eight is octa, but Immediately following that is a vowel, so we have to drop the A. So we have octoxide. So tribromine octoxide. A little bit of a tongue twister there. Yeah, you notice here it's got still got the A. That's okay. Because you left it on. But technically you're supposed to remove it because of the English rules. All right, how about this one? Who wants to try this one? What's, what is the base name for this one? Just give me the base name. Phosphorus sulfide. Sulfide. Phosphorus sulfide, there you go. Now you can slap in the, the prefixes. Tetraphosphorus uh, heptasulfide. You got it. Tetraphosphorus heptasulfide. Notice the A stays there because the S is not a vowel, okay? All right, this one's a pretty easy one. It's a nasty smelling gas. Next time you're in front of a car and you throw an exhaust and it smells like rotten egg, that's what you're sniffing. <laughs> Who wants to give a, get a shot on Sulfur trioxide. Name? Sulfur trioxide, exactly. It's also a pollutant. It gets up in the air, reacts with water to form uh, an acid eventually makes sulfuric acid, which then rains back down and destroys crops and all kinds of stuff. Okay, sulfur trioxide. All right, here's here's an interesting one. What about we got to get the formula here? Okay, and so here we're working backwards, like we were getting a name. I said look for the base name, and then throw in the prefixes. Well, here look for the base. Uh, formula and then throw in the numbers that you need to work with. Ion six. So ion six, exactly. So we got the uh, iodine and fluoride are the elements of concern. Then you come back and add the prefixes. There's only one iodine and there's six of them. So it's formula would be that one, IF6. Okay. Oh. What will be the oxidation number of an iodine in iodine hexafluoride? 
Anybody want to take a guess? Wait, can you see that one more time? Yeah, repeat that okay. one more time, please. Okay, what is the oxidation number of, let me highlight it. This is a good example. The oxidation number of iodine in this formula. Negative one. Mm. No. Okay, what do you know about the fluoride? What is this oxidation state? Okay, look at the name, it's iodine. So that means it's not, it's not the iodide, which would give a negative one. But fluoride is in the negative one state. How many do you have? Six. What does that mean that iodine must be in? Six. Exactly, positive six. Okay. Iodine, here's a special case for iodine because the size of it, it can do all kinds of other things. But the point of this is trying to get you to calculate the oxidation number of any element that you're given. Because, like I said earlier, you're always going to know what the oxidation number is of its partner. So in this case, because we're dealing with fluoride, that's always going to be a negative one. If things were reversed and the fluorine was first and then hexaiodide, and then iodide would be a negative one, okay? So here the fluoride is a negative one. There's six of them. That infers that iodine in this uh, configuration has a positive six oxidation number. It literally gave up six electrons. <clears throat> Not give them up, but sharing with fluorides. Okay, remember always that because there's homework that you you have where they're asking you to figure out the oxidation of some real crazy looking compounds. Just remember, okay, that the oxidation of the number of cations plus the number of anions would equal to the charge of the overall molecule which in this case is zero. Okay, so using that general equation, you can calculate the oxidation number of any combination. For example, what about the oxidation number of uh, sulfur? Oh, can you clear that? The oxidation number of sulfur in sulfur trioxide. What would be its oxidation number under this configuration, SO3. Would it be six? It'd be six, exactly. Because the oxides are negative two, you got six of them, but you got to say positive six. In this state, sulfur would be in a positive six state. Okay? Because when we talk about oxidation numbers, we have to, we have to uh, preface it with positive or negative. Alrighty, so so far so good. You can it. All right, here's this one. Uh, Perry formula, chlorine and oxygen, right? Because it's trichlorine dioxide. And so its formula would be subscript two for the chlorine and five for the oxide. What would be, okay, let's, let me take it a step further. These are the type of questions you find in the homework. Based on what you know right now, what would be the oxidation state of the chlorine in the state? Negative two. Oh. Would it be five? Well, first, would it be positive or negative? Oh, I'm sorry. It would be positive. Exactly, because it's in the chlorine. The name is chlorine. The oxide will be in the negative state. And since there's 10 of them, excuse me, five of them, each one brings in 10, 
that's a total of negative 10, right? Mm -hmm. That means that every chlorine has got to be a positive 5. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, We're going to a couple more slides and we'll be done. All right, so how about this one? Anybody, work? we're going to name this compound. Diphosphorus. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. uh, Diphosphorus tetrahydon. Or tetrahydon. Tetrahydon, yes. All right, diphosphorus tetrahydon. All right, so a couple of reminders. Okay, prefixes only for the covalent compounds. Don't mix and match. Okay, now the only time that you would see a prefix of some sort in an organic uh, ionic compound, which you might see in the homework, but um, you might have something like, let me draw something quick. Na2SO SO4. Okay, that's sodium phosphate. Sometimes you'll find an asterisk and then you'll see like maybe 2H2O. Ah, okay. You see an asterisk and then followed by an, an X number of molecules of water. Okay, so this would be sodium um, sulfate. Okay, dihydrate. Next time uh, you have these little packets and you buy some equipment or something you got, or you might find it in like a beef jerky, you get a little packet. Yeah, for um, some electronics, you get a little packet that don't eat. <laughs> okay, those are drying agents. Don't recommend to eat them. But what they do is uh, they're they are in normally what are called anhydrous. They're water free, but they had the tendency once you get moisture in the air to suck the air the water out of the uh, out of the air and form a complex with it. So what's happening? these drying agents would form these complexes. So you might see something like sodium sulfate dihydrate. Dihydrate means two waters, two molecules of water. But that would be the only time you would see a prefix. And that's just to name how many waters. So you could have pentahydrate, hexa, hexahydrate, whatever number of waters those molecules there. You might see a question like that in maybe in the homework. But not so much in, in the exams, okay? So, so the, the reminder here is with respect to uh, ionic compounds, the only time you see a prefix is when you got species like that, like that the anhydrous sodium sulfate. Um, Roman numerals only for those uh, variable charged metals, which is basically all the metals with the exception of those 16. Okay, so they're going to have a, a variable oxidation state. You might say, well, which one is it? Well, you're always going to know the charge of the anion. You can back calculate to figure out what the metal must be, what oxidation state, because the overall charge of the molecule will be zero, and you know the charge of the anions, you can do an algebraic expression to calculate the charge of the cation or the metal. Okay. Now, polyatomic ions, that's their name. Don't change them. You know, don't say it's for nitrate, say uh, nitrogen trioxide. That's not even, not, that's not the name of nitrate. Okay. So, um, I'm going to leave you with this. You might, here's the answers. You may want to try these at home. Try them without, uh, you know, looking at the answers. Unfortunately, I gave you the answers there, but here, copy them. 
work them through and see if you come up with that, okay? With respect to formula and or the name. Okay. All right, chapter eight, there's a worksheet. You know, get more practice, knock that out, help you out with the name. Uh, GCC is uh, fortunate, but uh, SCC, where my other class is, they require uh, a nomenclature exam for the force is worth 10%. So uh, for some reason, whatever reason, but they have to be able to get an 80% on 20 questions and about something like this. Here's a formula, give me the name or vice versa. All right, congratulations, you're done. We'll start with chapter nine on Thursday, unless you have any other questions. Uh, or comments or not, let me stop there.